Praise God for the privilege of being here this morning. Worshiping God. What a blessing we have. I just feel like I'd like to have a word of prayer. Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we look to Thee as we come before Thee to minister, to share with what You have laid upon our hearts, and that You would be glorified. Help us to walk in truth. Help us to interpret Thy truth in right ways. Help us to learn from it. May it be that which would be instrumental in helping us be faithful unto the end. May you be glorified. And we ask you to be in our midst and to guide and direct our tongue. We pray this all in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Amen. I likewise do what Laverne said he does. I like to study, especially Easter time and resurrection time and so forth. And I was doing that likewise the last number of weeks, reading about the uh, birth of Christ. And yet, this morning, there, God spoke to me in, in, in reading the Christmas story and meditating upon it. He spoke to me about a certain aspect, a different aspect of the Christmas story that he has led me to uh, use this morning and to see if we can gain insight from it for our lives day by day, beyond the Christmas season, but always as those who walk in holiness and desire to be ready to meet him when Jesus comes again or when our time ends. Um, as we think of the Christmas story, uh, I think of the Jews, the chief priests, and those who were um, waiting for years already for this promised Messiah to come. And um, as you think of that, and I thought, well, why aren't the Jewish leaders, why wouldn't they be the first ones to notice when the Messiah would come? There were prophecies where he would be born. We know that because they interpreted it to the three wise men when uh, they came and they asked. If we turn back to Micah, we have that one prophecy that tells us, and that's probably the verse they turned to, so they knew it, where it says in Micah 5, verse 2, it says, But thou, Bethlehem, Euphrata, though thou be little among the thousands in Judah, yet out of thee shall be come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old and from everlasting. It was not just a common king, it was an everlasting, he'd been in existence already, talking about the Messiah. They knew those things. There were other prophecies. If you look in the chain uh, Thompson's chain reference, you will notice there in the back that there were 42 references that the Thompson chain reference referred to as references of the Messiah coming in the Old Testament that probably these Jewish leaders knew and that they could refer back to. Why did they not? Well, I asked the question. They were able to tell the king where it was going to be, where they should find him. Why didn't they go? Do we read anywhere that Jewish leaders went to Bethlehem to find Jesus, the Messiah, the one they were looking for? No, we don't read that. They just gave that terrible order that was disguised. I want to worship him too, King Herod said, but that was a lie. He wanted to kill him. And God knew that. That's why the wise men were directed a different way. But you know, the shepherds, they heard that the king was born. There was, an, there was a showing forth of great, what do you call it? 
a greatness. Angels, the sky was filled with angels, and they made that announcement. The shepherds went almost immediately. Let us go see this king that has been born. See this great thing. I don't know what happened to the sheep. They probably, did they leave someone there to take care of him? But they left. They went to Bethlehem to bring honor and glory to God, to worship and make an announcement. They believed and went to find him. It was revealed from God Almighty, and they did that. They worshiped. Why didn't Israel's religious leaders recognize his coming? Question that went through my mind and I meditated upon. What could cause a person not to go? Why wouldn't they want to go? They were looking forward to the Messiah, but why wouldn't they go? Could it be? Could it be that they weren't in tune with God? They had their own idea of the Messiah. One that would come with great publicity and give them a natural freedom. Thus, it caused them to be unbelievers. I've entitled the message this morning, Do I Hear God's Voice? We notice here, the Jewish leaders didn't, didn't hear the voice of God. That's why they didn't go. I'd like to think of the, or turn with me to Luke 2, and I'd like to look at two persons that did welcome the Lord's anointed, the Messiah. And I'm going to read this portion here. Um, this portion here relates to 40 days after Jesus' birth when Mary and Joseph took Jesus into the temple to, uh, to present him before God, to present him before the Lord, and to give a sacrifice, give an offering for his birth. Most usually, when the first child was born, a male, uh, they were to give a lamb. But if they, were not, if they were poor, they were allowed to give two turtle doves, and that's what Jesus had. Mary and Joseph were poor, and they brought two turtle doves 40 days beyond his birth. And so they were bringing him into the temple here, for that purpose. And we'll begin reading in chapter 2, verse 25, and I'll read until verse 38. Pay attention about, and, and notice two people here that are often left out, but I'd like to meditate on this morning. <clears throat> and there it says in verse 25, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. Now, consolation there would, would bear out the thought that they were waiting for the Messiah or the one that would redeem them. And so he was waiting for that. Verse 26, And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do, after him, to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he up, him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all the people a light to lighten the Gentiles and, a glory, and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at these things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set forth for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign 
which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thy own soul also. And the thoughts of many hearts, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And there was one Anna, a prophetess, a daughter of Phineal, of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and had lived with an husband seven years from her virginity. And she was a widow of about fourscore and four years, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And she coming in at that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake unto him of all them and spake of him to all them that look for redemption in Jerusalem. Amen. That's as far as I've chosen to read this morning. Okay, we want to look at those two persons as we think of Simon and Anna, or Simeon and Anna. What made the difference that Jesus was welcomed at that time, but there were no Jewish leaders there. There was no one coming to welcome the Messiah from the church, you might say. Uh, those that had been called out to be the household for the Messiah, the children of Israel. But Simon and Anna welcomed him. They actively sought out a close relationship with God. How did Simeon do this? First of all, I noticed that Simeon went into the temple. Now, as I was meditating on this, Simeon didn't know that the Christ child was born. It was regular daily life for him, I believe, to go into the temple to worship. That was his a place to meet God. And so he was just doing his normal thing, went into the temple. But it does say that especially this day, the Spirit had led him, but I believe the Spirit was leading him in other days too, to go into the temple. There was a connection there. And Simeon heard God's voice. As the Holy Spirit spoke, he went and went into the temple. And it was revealed, probably not that morning, but other time, some other time it was probably revealed to him that he would not see the Lord's anointed, that he would see the Lord's anointed before he dies. And, and I presume because of that, that he was an older man, that he was waiting. And he was with anticipating, with anticipation, waiting for the time when he would see the Lord's Christ because there was a connection between him and God that said, you're going to see my salvation before you die. Do I hear God's voice as Simeon did? He went into the temple courts. It was important to him. It was something he normally did. But then, of course, he was moved by the Spirit to worship and to turn to God, to go to the right source to find answers. There must have been a commitment and a continual fellowship with God as I look at that and meditate upon it. Because no one told him that Jesus was coming. And I'm confident that when Mary and Joseph came, they didn't come up to Simeon and say, hey, this is the Lord's anointed. This is the Messiah. It's been revealed to us from before he was born. No, I don't think they did that. I don't picture a servant of God going forth in pride, showing that this is, going to, this is who we have here. But they didn't say anything. How did Simeon know that this was the Christ child? How did he know? The Holy Spirit. It tells us the Holy Spirit revealed it to him, and he accepted that truth. And so he held him in his arms, took him up, and was able to see him face to face. He didn't understand all things, I am sure. How is this 
going to be the Savior. But God revealed it to him that this child is going to be the one who would bring redemption to Israel. He was convinced of it because he prophesied concerning it also in relation to him being the Messiah, the blessed of God, the glorified one. Not just to Israel, but also for the Gentiles. In verse 32, he pointed that out. A light to lighten the Gentiles and a glory to thy people Israel. As I think of that, you know, the Jewish leaders, they were looking for a redeemer that was going to free them from the rule of Rome, that they could be their own again. So many times the children of Israel rose up in pride because of who they were, and they forgot God. And that's what was happening here. That's why they were not even going to Bethlehem to find the Messiah because I don't believe they thought the Messiah was going to come in that way. The Messiah would come in a glorious way and would reveal himself great and mighty. But it was in a natural way that they were looking for it. But here we see Simeon, I believe, it indicates in this portion of Scripture that he believed that this redemption was something else. It wasn't a natural redemption. It was a spiritual redemption. That's why he mentioned that this would reach further than just the Jewish nations. It was to all people and that he would enlighten the path for the Gentiles, all people. Simeon understood that. How come? It was his relationship with God. He was hearing the voice of God. We also want to notice that there was something else involved in relation to Simeon and his belief and his connection with God. He would have, would he have done what he did if he wouldn't have sensed the truth of God in his in, in what the Spirit said. He obeyed. When the Spirit moved him to go to the temple, and when the Spirit told him that this is the Christ child, he believed it, and he honored it by doing. Obedience was involved. If he would not have obeyed the Spirit's guidance, he would never have met the Messiah. He wouldn't have been there. The Jews weren't there. They didn't meet the Messiah. Not only do we need to be in tune with him, but we need to obey and receive to receive the blessings of God. Luke gives us the examples of Simeon and Anna of hearing God's word and directing them because they heeded his voice and were blessed. They glorified God. Jesus' message to the seven churches in Asia in Revelation chapters 2 and 3, you know, there's many voices that we hear sometimes. We have our own experience. We want God's voice. We want to hear what the Holy Spirit says especially when we have difficult decisions to make, we like to hear what God has to say, or I do, because God can see the future and I can't. And so he's in, he wants us to understand that, and, and I understand it. But we also know that how can we distinguish between the voices, the carnal voice and God's voice, or the Spirit's voice talking to us? In Revelation, we notice that to every church there in those chapters, the seven churches in Asia, when Jesus was giving them instruction and giving an example of their walk and what needed to be done uh, to
to be in accord with him. He gave that instruction, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. All the people, all people have spiritual ears, even the Gentiles, and we also. Do we hear when the Spirit says and talks and says something to us that we're in need of? Or if we're doing the right things, do we hear? We notice that Simeon did, and he did the right things. They were required then to do what God or the Spirit said, or he would remove the candle from their midst. And that is, he would remove the light. And it becomes a dying church when the light is removed. That light represents Christ, represents the Holy Spirit, represents the deity of God. If that candle is removed, he that heareth or he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. When God speaks to us, are we listening? Do we hear his voice? The Jewish leaders didn't, and they missed the Messiah. Going to the prophetess Anna, the last portion here, she was of great old age, it said. And if I just did some calculating here, if she had been married at the age of 15 and she lived with her husband seven years and was widowed for 84 years, she would have been 106 years old. So it was true that she was of great age, but it was not outlandish. It was something that could have been possible. Many, almost all my the ones I checked out concerning that, interpreters and so forth, or uh, people who seemingly know what they're saying, really were saying that uh, it's really translating to say that her age was 84 rather than what the Scripture says in King James. I don't know. It doesn't matter. She was old. But she was, the thing that's the most outstanding is the fact that she was faithful. Her important attribute was being faithful. She was a prophetess also. And the New Te- uh, early New Testament Greek writers would interpret such as a woman who interprets oracles or divine announcements, reveal secrets from God. What does it take to do that? We notice gives us some hints here of what it takes to do that. It says that she didn't depart from the temple. Again, we notice a connection of being connected and hearing the voice of God as being in fellowship and in a place of meeting God, the temple. Now, that could be in the church or it could be in your private home in your private time that you spend with God. Meeting God is a time when it uh, brings that unity that God can meet with us and we meet with him. And it's that which shows us that important aspect of being connected with God. We hear his voice. We notice another aspect that Uh, is important, I believe, that is an an important ingredient in being able to hear when he speaks to us, and that's prayer and fasting. She served God with fastings and prayers night and day. So we see that it was not just temporal or sporadic or when the need arose or when, when it suited, but she was there It was her continual thought pattern of being with God. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 instructs us to pray without ceasing, and I think we've had different times when that's been interpreted, that uh, we have a prayerful heart, that if God reveals something to you, 
no matter what you're doing, you have a desire to help, and so you just pray. You meet that need right immediately. I think that's more what it's talking about, praying continuously or praying without ceasing. Night and day. In the middle of the night, when you can't sleep, you can pray. You can meditate on scripture verses. Tim talked to us about last week about memorizing scripture so that you can call upon it and allow it to be that which comforts and renews our strength. And, and God talks to us back and forth in that way. It's hearing the voice of God. Like I said earlier, Luke gives us examples of Simon and Anna, of hearing God directing them. And because they heeded his voice, they were blessed. They could glorify God. They had those things that happened that met their needs and that brought honor and glory to the kingdom of God. And it also strengthened their belief in God. James 4.8 says, give us... Uh, Give, uh, James 4.8 gives us another directive to hear the voice of God, and that is that we are to draw nigh unto God, and he will draw nigh unto you, 4.8 of James. What does it mean to draw nigh to God? How can a person draw close to a holy God? We're carnal people. That relationship that we have, that we commune together with God, draws us to him. Jesus said, you must be born again. Having that relationship with him, a changed life. James tells us to cleanse your hands, purify your hearts. What does it mean to cleanse our hands? We also know that God will not hear us if we are not sincere and have sin in our lives. But if we are ready to cleanse our cleanse ourselves and purify our hearts before him. Isaiah 116 says, wash you, make you clean. It's a cleaning, a type of surrendering ourselves into God and asking him to clean us up. There's a relationship that's established then and there, and it will be that which will cause us to be born again. Ephesians 4, 22 to 24 says, that ye put off concerning the former conversation of the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and to be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. That's what God wants. That's what it takes to be washed, to be cleaned up, to draw nigh unto God. And he will draw nigh unto you. He will do that work for us. What a blessing. It gives joy and gladness. And it brings delight to God when children walk in obedience and truth. That was God's problem in the Old Testament so often. He said to Moses, he says, they aren't displeased with you. They're displeased with me. That's why they don't obey me. They don't want to do what... I ask them to do. They don't want to obey. It's not with you, but it's with me. Are we that way, or are we nigh unto God so that we can hear his voice and be drawn to him? Nigh relates to being in close proximity. Cleanness speaks of togetherness. Closeness speaks of togetherness, contact, holding, touching. Becoming involved in feelings and connecting with communicating, giving and receiving, trusting, all those things. Being compassionate, forgiving of tender spirit. All those relate to drawing nigh to God and having him clean us up. And then we can have communion with him. In John 10, 27, <clears throat> The illustration of the good shepherd, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. The challenge for me this morning is, 
Is my relationship with God so intense that when Jesus gives me direction, I hear and obey? That's what God wants. That's when he likes to draw nigh to us because there's a relationship there. Do I hear his voice when he speaks to me? Shall we kneel? For those who can, shall we kneel for prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, so often we want to hear your voice, but we so many times have other voices that want to distract us. Voices that Maybe our own desires slip in. I think of different Old Testament prophets that had their own way. We think of Jonah. He wanted to know your will. And yet, when you ask him to do something, he had his own voice that he was listening to. And he went away. We think of Balaam. He likewise wanted to. Do your work, but then he wanted his own voice. He heard his own voice. Our own carnal desire was involved, and it brought much destruction. And it wasn't that way of peace. It didn't build up your kingdom. It brought destruction. And yet you had your way. There are many other places, and so many times we do the same. Forgive us, Lord. Help us to honor thee and to have that close relationship and communion with you to where when you say something that we obey and we hear it and we walk according to your will and we are faithful. Lord, help us to understand that. And may Simeon and Anna speak to our hearts this morning and may it bring an honor to thee to be faithful in doing that which you would have us to. Give us courage and strength, and we need thy grace day by day. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen.